clearly there's a lot of people packed in today, and I'm talking about qualitative research. So for those of you who are qualitative researchers, you tend to describe um, your results of your qualitative research or your findings as you know, a few people said this, or some people said that, or many people said this. So if we were going to use that analogy, are many people here today out of your department, out of your PhD students? How would you describe it? Many, few, almost some? all. Almost all. Okay, so almost all. So that's the language that we use in qualitative research. But equally, that language can be quite daunting to people who have to make decisions because they can't interpret it very well. And I think qualitative research has got a, a really um, important role um, in combining with effect data, so policymakers and practitioners can make decisions. Um, I'm going to sort of share with you some work that I've been doing about assessing the certainty of, of evidence, of qualitative evidence, that I've been doing as part of my work um, in Cochrane. I'm the lead convener of the Qualitative and Implementation Methods Group. And of course, Cochrane sets the gold standards for systematic review methodology. Um, and a few years ago, they um, did um, a stakeholder review, and the, the stakeholders, the evidence users, said, well, Cochrane reviews are the gold standard, but it's not all the evidence that we need. Um, we need to include other forms of evidence, such as qualitative, to understand the implementation of evidence to patient views, etc. But the policymakers and the practitioners and the guideline people don't understand how to use qualitative evidence, because what does many, few, or often, or um, almost all mean when you're trying to make a decision about what to commission? So um, partly this comes out of this. Um, I'm also reminded that we've had quite a, a, a long relationship in terms of research, and every time I'm here, there's some controversy over qualitative research. So when I was last here, um, or the first time I was here talking about qualitative <coughs> research, um, we had just had a broadside in Cochrane. So Cochrane was very famous for the effect review. Um, and all of you will be familiar with the Cochrane collaboration. I don't need to explain about that because you're so sort of embedded in the Cochrane culture here. But Cochrane started off with the effect review with randomised controlled trials. It wasn't into incorporating qualitative evidence. Um, and we as a, a methods group have been trying to lobby for the inclusion of qualitative evidence for quite some time, but doing it in an evidential way. So developing and testing the methods that then actually could be put into the handbook. Then out of the blue, this paper came from Canadian colleagues, and they are nurses, you might know some of them, Deconstructing the Evidence Space, Discourse in Health Sciences, Truth, Power, and Fascism. And you'll see here it talks about um, the Cochrane Group um, excluding um, uh, qualitative evidence and giving privilege to the randomised controlled trial, um, and basically called Cochrane a fascist organisation for doing so. So you can imagine it, we were inside Cochrane trying to lobby for change, and this sort of thing isn't helpful at all. So I came to talk about it. Um, ben Goldacre, who writes in The Guardian, picked this up and said, of course, Cochrane isn't fascist. In fact, Archie Cochrane fought in the Spanish Civil War, and he exploded all of this in The Guardian newspaper. Well, we were quietly trying to work with people to get qualitative evidence accepted, so this wasn't helpful at all in, um, in a way. And Ben Goldacre didn't help us either, because in his column, and he went on television, um, and said, of course, Cochrane includes qualitative evidence in its systematic reviews, which at the time it didn't, so that didn't help. And then a certain Sam Porter and Peter Halloran waded in. <laughs> um, and you gave your postmodernist war on um, evidence-based practice, and you gave your viewpoint, and that, that was sort of generated after, after I'd come to do the seminar and shared my experiences of this war that was going on. Did that help? <laughs> well, the response, but the response was insufficient but still necessary. So I don't know whether that summed you up, Sam, or whether it's necessary <laughs> or whether that summed up the position. Um, but I thought this was an absolutely excellent riposte to, to the debate. Um, I thought that it was very well um, made, etc., but it didn't quieten the debate down. But we have made progress in Cochrane because in 2009 we published as a methods group our chapter in the Cochrane Handbook, uh, which is Chapter 20, Qualitative Research and Cochrane Reviews. Um, and the Cochrane Handbook's in two sections, Section 1, which is Standard Review um, Methodology, and then 
rather kindly, the innovative review methodology, which I think is a great way of describing qualitative um, research, is in the second part. So once you've got a chapter in the handbook, it becomes Cochrane policy, um, and you can integrate the qualitative evidence in selective reviews. Is that somebody else wanting to come in? <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> There's a chair with your name on it there. So that was a really important step for us. Um, and Cochrane has been very careful. It doesn't want the floodgates open with lots of qualitative evidence syntheses. You can't do a standalone one. It has to be integrated with a Cochrane effect review. And I think that Cochrane is very careful in terms of quality assurance. So it wants to make sure that the most important <coughs> questions are actually identified, that there's some prioritization, um, and that we go very carefully and organically. And you'll recognise some of the co-authors here, because Brona is, is here. This is um, a qualitative evidence synthesis. I was delighted to see Brona's review, um, effect review published in the BMJ on weaning. That's an excellent review. Um, and supplementing that now is a qualitative evidence synthesis, trying to explain the heterogeneity in the trials, why the results were quite different, and also the implementation factors, because that's the information that the decision makers want. Um, especially because in lots of these clinical questions, it's not a clear-cut thing, is it? The evidence can be quite contradictory. So I think more and more the decision makers and the guideline panels want us as people who manage evidence, want to make sort of the evidence clear, to give a much clearer steer of what the evidence means. So this is in the pipeline. Yet more. Hello, come in. <coughs> We'll do a quick shifty round. <laughs> this is all on film, it's going to look really good. So this is our first um, real success um, to share with you. At the time I was um, involved in working with some very familiar people to some of you, so Claire Glenton and Simon Lewin from the Norwegian Knowledge Centre. We were commissioned to do a series of, of um, systematic reviews funded by the WHO which was around the Millennium Development Goals and Maternal Child Health and task shifting. So if you think globally, there isn't um, sufficient healthcare professionals with the right training. Um, and to actually make sure that the Millennium De Development Goals and Maternal Child Health are achieved, there has to be this notion of task shifting, of, of, of shifting um, tasks to lower cadres of staff that you're more likely to be able to employ around the world. So we were commissioned to do a series of reviews. I've put some of them on here that might be interesting to you. Um, the first one is, is, this was Simon Lewin's review that was already published, Lay Health Workers in Primary and Community Healthcare. We combined that with a new review that we did on the barriers and facilitators to implementation of lay health workers. And that went into the global guideline. And then there were two other reviews, nurse doctor substitution and, and to and from midwife substitution. So there was a whole series of reviews. This, this review here is the first one ever published in the Cochrane Library that's a qualitative evidence synthesis, and it was published two weeks ago. Oh. All right, so we're really, really <coughs> proud of that. Um, and it's, it went through peer review really um, easily, um, and I think it's a good quality review. We've got great feedback on it. It was the first time that WHO had actually accepted a qualitative evidence synthesis at their guideline panel. So our thinking behind this, um, as part of the sort of methodological um, sort of preparation, was that we wanted to make sure that the evidence that we were presenting to the WHO guideline panel, who are multilingual from around the world, we wanted to make sure that it was really clear. So what we were giving them the steer on, what to commission and what to recommend, was really clear. Um, and so hence we came up with CERCLOP. Um, there's just a plug for the, the, the website, just so that you can have a look at it. The WHO recommendations on optimised for maternal child health. It's a global guideline for all um, WHO um, countries. Um, it comes all with a video and everything. And um, we hope that in the next breath, if we still have case studies, this would be a brilliant mm -hmm. case study for us. So. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Cochrane um, funded me, and I was really grateful for this, to do um, some methodological work. So we sort of combined it all together. Um, and so we've got a, a study going called the Methodological Investigation of Cochrane Reviews of Complex Interventions, the Mickey Project. Um, and part of that was we took 50 methodologists off to uh, Montebello in Canada in January 2012. And we were locked in this wonderful ski resort without having any opportunity to ski for four days. Um, but the thinking and the discussion that came out of that was amazing, coming away from your workplaces. So 
for the wonderful PhD students I met at coffee, we got a dialogue going, didn't we? And we started talking about some of your issues and problems. Can you imagine four days of that while you're talking about methodology with these brains? So you've got Mary Dixon Woods <coughs> here, you've got S Sasha Shepherd there, Mark Pettigrew there. Um, oh gosh, you know, the, the brains that were in that room were just amazing. So we had this opportunity to try and tackle some of the sort of really difficult. Um, methodological issues and one of the things was you know we, we needed to put some certainty around qualitative evidence um, and out of that came a series of eight papers nothing to do with circle um, but eight position papers with um, an editorial by Jeff Wong so I think that this provided us with the, sort of the thinking of the platform and set off all the circle thinking that we then as a subgroup developed so this is the methodological imperative for coming up with circle and trying to create this tool to make an assessment of the certainty of evidence so that we know that qualitative evidence syntheses are increasing in number, they're now very common, they're much more accepted. Uh, we've got to the stage where the methods for qualitative evidence synthesis are a lot more um, defined, we, we've seen a lot um, more published, some are better than others but we're seeing some good quality ones now. Um, and as I said before, um, WHO and NICE Public Health Guidelines and now Cochrane all want to see qualitative evidence. Um, and so therefore we felt that, um, as with reviews of effectiveness, we needed to do some methodological work about the certainty. So this is a novel um, approach for assessing how much certainty um, to place in qualitative <coughs> findings. Um, it's in development still. Um, we've been working on it for about a year. Um, and any feedback that you have would be um, really most appreciated. Um, I think that you need to see this in the context that we've been developing this um, whilst thinking about the needs of guidelines and decision makers. I don't think that it is so applicable if you wanted to do a, a qualitative evidence synthesis to develop theory. So if you were starting off with um, you wanted to do a theoretical model of something, then this isn't so important because you don't worry so much about the certainty of evidence because you're hypothesizing, aren't you? So this is in a Cochrane context where you're synthesizing evidence so that people can actually make decisions based on your synthesis of evidence when integrated with effect data. Um, and just to give some clarity of definitions, certainty in this context is the extent to which the review finding is trustworthy or valid. And that's a finding synthesized across studies. Okay, so we're not just looking at findings in individual studies, we're findings synthesized across studies. Um, so we had some sort of parameters and requirements. Um, it had to be simple, it had to be easy to apply, um, the tool. It had to accommodate any qualitative design. And it had to allow for some judgments um, because you have to be able to have some flexibility. Um, and we also wanted it to um, sort of mirror a grade approach. Um, so the grade approach for assessing um, certainty in quantitative um, studies so that people would actually um, be able to recognise the approach and make sense of it. Um, so we started off with a basic set of requirements and being Cochrane, we did some uh, evidence-based trials. So we looked for existing tools in the area. Um, we had a series of discussions and working groups. Um, we started developing and talking to people and then we've piloted the tool that we've got on three qualitative evidence syntheses now um, and two of which are published. So the Lay Health Worker Review you'll see that's published in the library. There is our experience of using Circle published in that at the same time. So it's dual purpose. Um, and we've obviously got feedback and we've just come back from the Cochrane Colloquium in Quebec and had a whole meeting on this. Um, and we're now sort of translating into um, a circle working group that's like the grade working group, so we'll be developing that over time. So, this is the circle approach. So, it is a system, and you want to do, uh, assess the degree of certainty of the review finding. There's two strands to it, and two levels of assessment that are then combined. <coughs> the first one will be very familiar to you, so it's the, the assessment of methodological limitations or quality of the study. Um, and that you could do using a critical appraisal skills program tool um, or any other tool that's appropriate for the study that you're looking at. And then on this side, the coherence of the review finding, um, we make an assessment of that. And again, the definition of coherence in this context is assessed by the extent to which we're able to identify a clear pattern across the individual study data. And I'll show you a little bit more about that, and then you combine the two. So. Let's have a look at that with a few more definitions of terms. So the methodological limitations of the study using CAST, most of you will have applied a critical appraisal school um, skills programme tool or something similar to that. 
and you want to sort of look at the methodological limitations of the study. Uh, we use CASP in our Cochrane reviews. As a qualitative methods group, we don't make any particular recommendations about which tool. We just say that you can choose an appropriate one. Um, and we, we come from the assumption, or we made the assumption, that findings from well-conducted studies are likely to be more trustworthy than those from um, studies that aren't going to be, or haven't been conducted um, particularly well. And then the coherence of the review finding. Um, we've made the assumptions that the review um, finding is more coherent um, if you can see a clear pattern that can be identified across study data. And these could include these follow uh, the following examples. So um, circumstances <coughs> where the review finding is consistent across multiple contexts, and think WHOs was a global context, or where the review finding incorporates explanations for any variations across individual studies. So there is flexibility as long as they're explained. <coughs> And coherence may be further strengthened if the individual studies contributing to the finding are drawn from a wide range of settings. And I think for all of you that are familiar with con uh, qualitative research, context is really important, isn't it? And the debate of, uh, to which extent um, findings are transferable is hotly contested. Um, and yet if we are going to um, have qualitative evidence inform guideline development, you need to know whether it is plausible to transfer the findings to different settings. Otherwise, qualitative evidence will never get into guidelines. And that, that seems to us to be a bit of a shame. So this is the sort of approach. It's very similar to grade. And there's a series of ups and downs in terms of level. So we've got a three-level um, tool, um, which is high, meet, moderate, and low certainty. Um, so a review finding drawn from generally well-conducted studies with a few methodological limitations and showing high levels of coherence is high. And then the moderate is a review finding where there are concerns regarding either the methodological <coughs> limitations of the studies or the coherence of the review finding. Could be up or down either way. And then low certainty um, is a review finding based on studies with important methodological limitations and where there are concerns regarding the coherence of the review finding. So for each finding, you'd give a level of certainty. Okay, so you might have multiple um, findings across the review, and you'd give a level of certainty to each finding. So let's have a look um, at what we did with the lay health worker review. So this is now published in the Cochrane Library. Um, and again, I mean, Brona and I had a, a, a long conversation yesterday, because these are reviews within a Cochrane context. And so in a, um, a qualitative evidence synthesis, you do some way of, of synthesizing the, the, the concepts and the themes and the constructs across the studies, and you come up with some sort of thematic analysis, don't you? And you come up with a synthetic product um, that hopefully isn't seen in the original study. So you've got some sort of synthesized product across studies. But then from that, in a Cochrane context, you need a sort of sense of evidence statements um, so for our evidence statements that came from the themes that were generated from all the qualitative studies around lay health workers, this was around the themes of um, factors that affect lay, lay health worker programs, acceptability, appropriateness, and credibility. And this was about the lay health worker recipient relationship. So the findings, the finding one and two here, um, so for example, finding quite one is, is quite long. So program recipients were generally very positive to the lay health worker programs. They expressed confidence in the knowledge and skills of lay health workers and saw them as a useful source of information. They also appreciated the nature of the lay health worker recipient relationship, emphasizing the similarities they saw between da 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 da. So that's the finding that we came up with with the qualitative synthesis as a statement. Okay. Um, this is the level of certainty, and this is what it means. So that's the finding. That's the level of certainty we placed on it. And this is the explanation why. So in general, the studies were of moderate quality and the finding was seen across a st several studies and settings. Okay, So that's how we did these big evidence tables. Um, and the guideline producers really liked that because it was really, really clear. Um, how we then translated <coughs> that, um, we created what we felt uh, feel are equivalent to the summary findings tables um, using Cochrane reviews. Um, so that it was really clear uh, what the problem was and what we were recommending. So I've got a portion of the guideline um, table here, or the summary findings table. So bear in mind that there's the whole evidence of effectiveness above this. But we had a series, I think it was 24 questions we were asked to address. And this is um, question 2.1 and question 2.2. .2. 
And the question was, should low health workers administer oxytocin to A, prevent and B, treat postpartum hemorrhage using a standard syringe, right? So that's your typical question that you're asked to um, address um, in terms of guidelines. So here's the problem, um, that there's poor access to prevention and treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. The options um, that, we were, that the guideline panel have to consider is lay health workers administering oxytocin using a standard syringe. The comparison <coughs> is care delivered by other cadres or no care. And the setting is community primary health care settings in low and middle income countries with poor access to health professionals. And this part of the sort of summary findings table is around acceptability, uh, which is where it comes from the qualitative evidence. And it says, is the option acceptable to most stakeholders? The stakeholders are, in this circumstance, being often the providers of care and the women who receive the care. Um, and this is a summary of the qualitative evidence. So you can see the options here. Um, they go from no to um, probably no, uncertain, probably yes, yes, and there is. I would like to concertina them down because there's too much wriggle room there, but this was our first go at this. Um, and we had to design all of this within a very short space of time, so there's lots of room for improvement here. And you'll see here that each level of certainty is put in, so there was a statement here which said it was low certainty evidence, and then there was a link to the, um, at the bottom to um, all our, our qualitative summary statements, and behind that were the original systematic reviews. And this was the sort of table of evidence that was presented to the guideline panel. Um, we also did a sort of a video of how to use it as well, um, so that people could use evidence. So above this, they had the effectiveness of evidence, then there was some acceptability evidence, and then we did a few things around implementation as well. So that's how you would interpret the evidence and be really clear. So we were saying to the guideline panel, it's really uncertain whether this would be acceptable or not. So there are some similarities and differences between GRADE and CIRCLE. Um, we clearly both are conceptually quite similar in what they're trying to achieve. Um, and we want to, with CIRCLE, we want to um, assess certainty in evidence, not confidence in evidence. Um, I think that the interesting thing about GRADE is um, the GRADE people are very keen on this approach. They like the CIRCLE <coughs> approach. They recognize it, um, and they would like our little working group to become part of the grade working group or a sibling of the grade working group, which I think is, is good. Um, and Cochrane has begun to embrace this as a concept as something that's good and important. Um, so getting that message across about the contribution of qualitative research has been really quite easy. Um, and I think that that's been a sort of almost like a major battle won really in Cochrane. Um, and I know that, you know, Sometimes the, getting the importance of qualitative research and decision making doesn't always get across. And one of the meetings that I went to, I was asked to um, to give an a, 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 the question went like this: um, Well, just tell me any study that's ever made a difference, any qualitative study that's ever made a difference, right? You know, randomised trials make a difference. Has any qualitative study ever made a difference? And of course, the easiest one to say is maternity care and Oakley, from here to maternity. Fantastic ethnographic long-term engagement in, in, in the women's maternity services. Open the lid on women's experiences of maternity for the first time in, in the UK, at least. And that turned it at the head. Um, on how we deliver maternity services. So that is an example where there's been more reconfiguration of women's services um, than any randomised controlled trial. Go back further, Goffman and the asylums. Um, again, that exposed the lid on asylums. So there are big studies that have had huge impact on the way we deliver <coughs> care and services. I think sometimes we need to plug that home a bit. Okay, so let's conceptually look, just look at the difference. Um, Grade looks at risk of bias. Um, in CERCLA, we look at the methodological limitations of the contributing studies, um, and we've said that many tools are available for that, we don't mind which one. In consistency, um, on the grade side, we probably mean coherence of review findings and, and lower certainty where there's no, no clear pattern. Indirectness doesn't really map across. Um, we haven't quite worked out how to consider this indirectness as yet. We could interpret it if it's important about there being a sort of, you know, um, greater consistency of findings in, in a certain direction that, you know, um, more people favoured than didn't or whatever, but 
we don't think indirectness is, is so important for us. In precision, we don't feel is a relevant concept in qualitative research, but may be captured onto coherence. And publication bias, we, we think this is probably the most important thing to consider. Um, we use sampling often in qualitative research, and in systematic reviews, we're replicating those same sorts of things. We are sampling um, in some areas. And in the lay health worker review, we had to sample the studies that we actually included, which is <coughs> very different. In a Cochrane intervention review, in fact, you don't actually aim to put all the trials in, wouldn't you, that met a, a quality threshold. Um, you can imagine in the lay health worker review, there were hundreds and hundreds of qualitative studies. And the sorts of decisions that we had to make is this was going to be a global guideline, so we wanted evidence from around the globe. And some of the evidence from some countries was very low quality, but it was the only evidence. So was it better to have some evidence rather than no evidence? Whereas in the UK, um, lay health workers support breastfeeding. We had hundreds of high quality studies. Um, supporting breastfeeding in a UK context or European context. So we sampled those. But you have to be very careful that you then don't put a publication bias in. And the publication biases are likely to be um, probably important for the question that you're attempting to address. So those are individual review things that you need to come up with and make transparent. So we want to do a bit more work on the publication bias bit. So next steps, this is a work in progress, we're going to develop it further. Um, as I said, we've piloted it in two Cochrane reviews and two non-Cochrane reviews. Um, and we've got a paper and publication proposing and describing um, the outline as we are at the moment. Um, I think that as a small group, we're pleased by the way that it's been received. Um, the guideline developers really liked it. Um, qualitative researchers absolutely hate it. <laughs> Um, and I can see that, you know, epistemologically it might actually be very hard for you to get your head around this, that you would actually put levels of certainty on quantitative evidence. But you can see the reasons why we might want to do it, and I think it's a chicken and egg. We need qualitative evidence to be recognised, to go into guidelines, to make a difference, and to do that, it needs to be organised and presented in a way that people understand it. So I'd be really interested to hear your um, views on that. Um, so I guess, you know, we feel it provides a transparent way, a transparent method for assessing certainty of evidence. Um, and we're hoping that Cochrane will take it on board once we've got, uh, got the, the technique published. Um, and we're about to update the Cochrane handbook. That's in train for the next 12 to 14 months. So you may well see this being a recommend recommendation into the handbook to use if appropriate. So I'd be really interested to hear your views on it, which I would take back if that's okay to the small working group. Um, primarily, is it a good thing? Um, should we be doing it? How could we improve it? Um, what are your first impressions about it? Um, if you're a PhD student, do you understand it, or can I make anything clearer? So, um, thanks for the opportunity to come and share it with you. So, look forward to your feedback. Thank you. So, yeah, Jim wants to know what we think. And she really wants to know what we think. I do, because I know that you're a very Thank you, people. Well, I can tell you, from my perspective, I really like it, but then I'm more a quantitative researcher yes. than a qualitative and researcher, so I'd be interested mm -hmm. to hear what other people think, but certainly from someone who has conducted systematic reviews and used grade, and, and uh, so I can understand the whole process behind that, and, and I think that's a lovely way of bringing in qualitative research, although I'm not a true qualitative researcher. So from my perspective, and I think you'll find a lot of people maybe in the same boat as me will probably like it quite a lot. But, but you are involved in qualitative sense. synthesis at the moment. Yes. Yes, but I've still got my quantitative head on. Even when you're in there, you, yes, because you're the person who did the quantitative review. Yes. Yeah. Now, that said, it, Joanne found a wee, she, she took a wee while to get her head round it because she's more a qualitative mm -hmm person on this synthesis than, than me. So, um, yeah. but I think some of the sticking points that we've, you know, I can see, because I'm a health services researcher, so I'm equally as comfortable leading a trial as I am doing a qualitative research or an ethnography. Um, and there are some assumptions in the qualitative world that if you actually do multiples of qualitative studies, and you can, no matter what quality they are, they, that you come up with the same findings. So if you've read Noblet and Hare's book about meta-ethnography, um, they say that you can have a nugget in a low quality study that makes a contribution towards the evidence base. So how does that fit conceptually with this? Now, 
I have a sort of a sense that if you have multiple poor quality qualitative studies that say similar things, if you actually um, synthesise them all together, does it suddenly make them high quality? Um, and I have a sort of assumption that if I put all my cards on the table, having read some of these qualitative studies from, from um, some countries, they were so poor, and you could see the replication of terms from the study that was pu published before. So I don't think that there's a really good um, transparency of, of clear and independent thought going into some of these low quality studies. They've read the previous one, and that's influenced their thinking. So they've, they've used the same sort of thematic framework, or you know, there's very little quotes that are put forward, there's no evidence to underpin it. So that's why even though you can have consistent findings across many studies, but if, um, if there's uncertainty about the, the quality of them, we've actually put it as moderate certainty, not high certainty. And that seems to be the sticking point for qualitative researchers. So I'd ask, ask you, how does that fit with you? I'm not I'm here, not as a researcher or as a PhD student, but somebody who, who teaches elements of this to undergrads. But, and, and to master's students uh, in terms of supervision. The question I wrote down about 10 months ago was, is truth lost? Yeah. Uh, and the application of a framework, um, the, the, the circle, I like, uh, expand on my question, is there a danger of circle applying a tight structure to synthesis review, which is incongruent with the flexibility, truth element of individual patient experiences? Mm. I mean, <coughs> I think it's brilliant that qualitative research occupies a higher so, uh, yeah. position in terms of evidence, but <coughs> is there a danger of applying such a tight structure to the synthesis of quality review, review that truth is lost? I think that's an excellent point to make because when you're doing that, and I think the context is all important in the type of question, so when, when you're invited by the WHO to do a global guideline, you can imagine that you synthesise up quite high and you're not synthesising on a country level, because you could have addressed the same questions on a country level, couldn't you? Yeah. Um, so implementing lay health workers in the UK, for example, is going to have its whole evidence set. We have to look at it in a global context. So if you've um, <coughs> read John Lavis's work, there was a fantastic series of, of um, um, articles, I think in about 2011, about how you implement uh, evidence locally, and how you make sure that these, these global guidelines actually have truth and resonance locally. So you will see in the, the big guideline, and I do recommend that you have a look at it, there is a sense that you might need to synthesize some local evidence in order to make sure that contextually it's right. And that's where your expert judgment comes in, isn't it? Because in qualitative research, when you read findings, they either resonate with them or you don't. And that's something that, that guideline panel people find quite difficult, but conceptually I find it quite easy. Um, and we also work with a huge expert panel here, so there were 14,000 people that we could um, communicate with worldwide that were all part of this WHO network. Um, and when we asked them, for example, um, does, do these findings resonate with you, we got some, obviously, a range of feedback. Um, so I think the answer to that question is multi-layered. I think you can strip truth out, but it depends on the type of question that you, you're asking, doesn't it? What, what do you think? Well, well, anything that promotes qualitative research being used as evidence is, is right up my street, which is why I'm here today. Um, but I'm not sure. I, I, I just got a sense that you know, low, moderate, and, and high um, were, were, was quite a very tight structure to apply to something that, by design, is meant to be flexible and, yeah. and, and more embracing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Could I ask you, and I was just going um, what Colin was saying. Whenever you're um, doing your assessment, is it the same as a Cochrane review that you use two or more peer, um, two reviewers to look at the evidence yeah. and to come up with the level of certainty? Yes, yeah, so in a Cochrane sense, yes, everything is double data processing. Yes. Um, <coughs> Because we were actually innovating and doing this at the same time, I would say that it wasn't a completely independent process because we were trialling it. But I think for the future, we would actually say that it would be an independent process and then you would confirm. Because that would be important to have that sort of internal validation within the review. Which is, I think, about the truthfulness point of view as well, because then obviously if you're finding it in qualitative studies and randomised control trials and different levels of studies, and it's across different um, individuals have identified it then. I agree. It's strengthening. I agree. And I mean, we, we 
th this is all quite new ground, isn't it, for Cochrane? And um, we, I've had the, the, the real benefit of working on a few reviews and knitting them together, so the, the effect with the qualitative, and we're doing it almost in a, a real-time process with the weaning review. And I'm particularly interested to what hypotheses and conclusions the original trial authors came, or the, 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 the original trial authors came up with, as to why they thought that the weaning interventions were working or not, to see whether they're borne out by the qualitative evidence. So, you, in, as a qualitative research, you trial this multiple triangulation stuff, don't you? Um, and I think that that's also an interesting avenue to look at. Um, to what extent are the trial authors generating hypotheses as to why they think something has, has worked or not? versus the qualitative evidence. But I, mean, I, I like the, the weaning review very much because it comes up with some real um, practitioner-based experiential stuff that the, it looks like the trialists haven't even thought of. So it means that there is a real supplementation and added value of looking at the implementation of evidence and experience, even though that a lot of the studies are very low-quality studies. There's still a value in doing it. Um, and I think, you know, qualitative studies are getting better. I think there's no doubt there is a, a better quality qualitative study now than the past. Um, just to answer your question too, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with what you're doing as a qualitative researcher. I think it's terrific. But I think, um, I think it's because you're doing it for a very specific purpose. Mm -hmm. You're doing it within Cochrane where you're looking for questions that can speak to clinicians. And so you're assessing qualitative research with that hat on, so it's coming up from that point of view. Because um, as a sociologist, when I'm writing as a sociologist for qualitative research, I think if my work is to be peer reviewed amongst that community, the quality would be more assessed in terms of, well, how much theoretical input is in here? Yeah. How much am I speaking to the wider sociological theoretical knowledge? And often um, we don't give enough um, room then to talk about the methodological components of that. Yes. And we definitely would not write down things like, you know, two people looked at this and so on. We just assume, well, of course we did that, <laughs> you know, yes. or something like that. Or of course, we, maybe we didn't, you know, but, you know, we kind of dismiss that little bit. We don't look to the methodological parts of it, I think, enough. Well, so the thing is that um, that would be, when I, if I was doing a sociological critique of a lot of the studies that you look at, I would think they're weak because mm -hmm. they're not theoretically informed usually. But they don't, they're not because they're answering a different question and they're speaking to clinicians. Yes. So I think it's useful within that context. But then it's not useful if it's ex, you know, exported to qualitative research per se. Yes. Where, you know, where I think um, it would be judged more in terms of well, what sort of theoretical frameworks are you bringing to the table before you ever begin? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you on that one. And um, The bottom line in Cochrane, um, because we are working within a Cochrane context, is that um, studies need to be quality and praise. So one of the central tenets of the of Cochrane review that makes it a systematic review is that you follow the systematic processing and quality appraisal. So we can't get away from that, so we've had to recommend it. If you're doing a matter of ethnography, for example, and you read um, Not Mr. Hell's <coughs> book, they mention nothing about quality appraisal. And there are quite a few um, quality, qualitative evidence synthesis methods that, that suggest that you don't appraise. Right? Mm -hmm. But this is Cochrane, and we, you know, I think quality appraisal does give you a sense of strength of the evidence. Um, we also had a conversation yesterday about what do you do then if you've got several very high quality studies and then a few really low quality studies, what do you do then? Um, and we've been playing around with the notion of sensitivity analysis and qualitative research. So um, it's, it's very usual in a, in a um, synthesis of, of effects and trials to do a, a sensitivity analysis, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But we've played around with taking, um, doing a, putting all the evidence in, doing the synthesis, creating the statements, um, but then taking the low quality evidence out and seeing if it makes a difference. And in the low health worker review, it didn't. So that gave us the, the com more confidence than the evidence, and perhaps confidence could then be actually equated to true. Um, so you, that those co concepts might be actually sort of mutually beneficial. Um, the other point to make is that this, we need to conceptualise the types of evidence that is going into these reviews. So. Um, for the nurse doctor substitution review, you can imagine in a UK context, nurse-led care is now quite common. So there's lots of randomised controlled trials with process evaluations. 
Um, and that type of evidence, the sort of qualitative interviews that you do with alongside with randomized controlled trials and the sort of questionnaire surveys that you might bung in, they tend to be not strong qualitative studies, right? So they're not generally they don't tend to be theoretically informed, they're quite brief interviews, they tend to be more structured because they're, they're zooming down on something that's about answering the, the implementation issues and acceptability around the trial. But they are about that intervention, they're firmly linked to that intervention. Put it in the context of a trial, in a trial you're likely to get much higher quality care and it's likely to be quite removed sometimes unless it's a really pragmatic or a cluster trial from the usual experience of when something's been implemented way down the line and there's no trial and it's just usual care and I come along and do a qualitative study. That's likely to be much more raw experience of care, isn't it, as it is pragmatic. Um, and yet for many of these trials we don't have process evaluation. So what we're doing is more generally doing a wider search for evidence as we've done with the weaning. And we've taken qualitative evidence that's views and experiences of, of weaning protocols generally and patient experience or the disease experience or whatever, and then relating it back to the original effect data. So I think that one of the things that we're doing in the Mickey project is on trying to unpack the different types of evidence and what that actually also might mean. So, I mean, maybe in a year's time we can come back and talk about the different types of evidence and what that might mean and does it make a difference. Because these things, I think, are important, but at the moment we all treat them as not being important. It's a bit like complexity and complex interventions. You can ask a simple question of a complex intervention. It's only when you ask a complex question of a complex intervention and complexity becomes important that you need a whole new set of methods to explore it. Other than that, you ignore it. Um, so these things are important. Hi, Jane. Hi. I, I was going to ask you, and I think you've answered it a lot about pulling together qualitative and quantitative evidence, and you've answered it quite a lot in terms of the weaning um, example, but instead can I ask you to talk a little bit more about how you go about sampling for a qualitative synthesis? Yeah, I talked a little bit about really that, but I'd really that, like to know more about it that. It depends on the approach that you're using, alright? Um, so let's put all of this aside for the second. It depends on how much evidence that you've got there, and there is real value in doing a scoping review before you do a systematic review, <coughs> so you know exactly what's there and you know the type of, of um, evidence. So is it really rich, conceptually deep, theoretically informed evidence, or is it lots of sort of small interview studies with a few people? Um, that can give you some help in terms of the, the method of synthesis that you would use. So if you had very rich, conceptually rich studies, you might consider a meta-ethnography. If you consider a meta-ethnography, you can only actually accommodate so many studies in a meta-ethnography, because there's only so many reciprocal translations across studies that you can achieve, right, before it becomes completely messy and incoherent. So you do, you know, the, the, the largest study um, of metroethnographer I've seen is with about 36 studies, but it got messy. Um, you know, once you get over 20, right? So mm -hmm. you might have to consider another approach. If you, um, with like us, we had hundreds of studies, you can use all sorts of different criteria. Mm -hmm. um, um, I like Maria's stance about putting some more theory in. So you might actually then draw up a theoretical sampling frame and decide that you want a spread of evidence um, from different countries with different women's experience. I wouldn't necessarily just put all the high quality evidence in because it might actually then you know, exclude something that's really important from an area that's particularly under-researched. Because mm -hmm. that all the primary studies aren't addressing the same question. Mm -hmm. um, and the lesson that we had with the qualitative evidence synthesis that I've done thus far is that you can actually have studies that are relevant but they're answering different questions and the evidence mm -hmm. within the study that's relevant to you might be a tiny part of it, mm. right? So then you have to actually think about the magnitude of the evidence that you might be extracting. It might be lots of studies, but only a tiny part to address your questions. So there's no one easy answer in okay. terms of sampling. And that's why being in a team and having these team decisions and, and having some transparency of what you're doing and what you've done <coughs> is really and important. Why. Mm -hmm. And why. Okay. Thanks. Jane, um, the bit I'm struggling with, I suppose, is to carry on that discussion, is how do you sample in the first instance? How do you manage the risk of bias at the sampling stage, or is that, do you regard that as an irrelevant question? No, I regard it as highly relevant. So if you're following an epicenter approach, you would do an entire scoping review of all the evidence to start mm -hmm. with, and code it, and so you'd know the entire 
domain of evidence, and then you would sample from that, having actually coded all your evidence. Um, mostly, we don't have time to do that with the WHO reviews. We had to go straight in there. We had a year to do six reviews um, globally with um, lower-income low country leading it, um, which was an interesting experience. Um, <laughs> but the, we did have to make some decisions, and we made them as team decisions. And we actually um, sat down with the questions and actually came up with some criteria for how we were going to sample. Um, and those were quite pragmatic decisions, and I think that there needs to be more testing of doing this. Of did what? you do that before you've done a scoping review? No, we didn't do a scoping review with this. So what would you do it before a scoping review? Yeah. I think it does depend on the question. I think it does depend on the question. Um, if, you, if you were doing a sort of a yoke review with an intervention review, yes. do, you, do you think it's important to have somebody on the intervention review as part of the team doing a qualitative review? Okay, so that's a really interesting thing. So um, you'll see with the lay health worker review, um, Simon Lewin was the lead author on the intervention review. He was also on the qualitative mm -hmm. review, and he has the unique characteristics of understanding both paradigms. And it was absolutely invaluable that he could interpret the effect evidence mm -hmm. and help us interpret the qualitative evidence. It added a whole new dimension. Mm -hmm. um, and Claire Glenton, who works with Simon, they have offices next door to each other. Um, so all the sorts of discussions that you had, I mean, we had a great discussion at coffee time. You need to have those discussions and the dialogues and the mapping and the diagramming to understand all of this and then present it in a coherent way. Um, with the nurse doctor substitution review, um, the, the quant review, um, Miranda Laurent's review, was already published in the library, and then we brought her on. And then we had to do the team building, and then there were lots of gatekeeping, and then we had to create memorandum of understanding. And then we had to do the qualitative evidence synthesis and try and actually integrate it with that review. And you know, we're still working on finding the common ground on that. So no doubt the two teams doing both reviews does make a difference. Hi, Jane. Um, so I'm in, in the middle of sort of doing systematic reviews now. Yeah, and I went to the Cochrane training and where my reviews won't be um, the non Cochrane. So in the Cochrane training, obviously, it kind of focuses more on the quantitative stuff. So um, I'm not familiar with you know how to integrate then if there's mixed methodology. So I'm assuming that um, my stuff uh, it's it's more sort of attitude and understanding and you know people's experiences. So I'm assuming that my um, data that I'm going to be coming up with is going to be predominantly qualitative. So d would you recommend? Um, I mean, what is the Cochrane Protocol on mixed methods and a narrative synthesis for mixed methodology? Would you recommend doing both separate and trying to map them across? Or, you know, could you recommend any guidelines or frameworks for mixed okay, methods so and narrative synthesis? Yeah, so put, in the co put yourself in Cochrane. Um, Cochrane's primary product is the effect review. So what we're doing is adding a qualitative synthesis. So we, you, you know, you can have two teams doing the two reviews together, but within a Cochrane context, the, the, the effect review is, is almost the, the primary product, okay? But outside of Cochrane, um, there are methods for mixed methods approach. So Jenny Pope's narrative synthesis approach is a mixed method approach, a Bayesian synthesis approach is where you um, tend to um, quantify and add factors to the qualitative evidence. So you've got approaches that either qualitize the quantitative evidence or, or quantify the qualitative evidence to integrate them. There's a whole pattern of methodologies out there that you can look at. Um, I still quite like the sort of idea of doing the effect review and getting that really strong evidence and doing the qualitative evidence synthesis and then coming at some stage together for an integration. But I also understand if you're working together, the qualitative evidence can help you identify which outcomes might be important, which processes you might want to explore, which subgroup analyses to do, even to refine your question. Right? So there are benefits of doing them in parallel and then um, one influencing the other. And um, equally, the effect data might give you um, an, uh, an avenue of exploration, the qualitative data to try and explain it, because you don't know the heterogeneity before you... So can you see there's lots of reasons for doing that? Um, as far as the methods of integrating the qualitative and the quantitative, that's still quite a new area. So in this particular review, we used um, hypotheses and lines of argument in the form of logic models where we actually took the effect um, evidence and we created a line of argument, a bit like in a meta-ethnography where you create a line of argument. 
and we actually put positive and negative modifiers as to why something was implemented successfully or not. So it's sort of like a diagram across a linear diagram, so it would actually have the finding, the positive moderator, the negative moderator, and then the um, process outcomes, and then the final outcomes, long-term outcomes of what you wanted to see. And we presented that as a way of integrating the evidence. Bridget Candy, for example, is just doing a PhD, a methodological PhD. She's looking at truth tables. Um, again, very complicated. We might try that with one of our reviews, but that's another way of doing it. Um, James Harden and Angela Thomas did a fantastic example in the BMJ, which was about fruit and vegetable consumption um, in children that we followed, where they um, took all the interventions, the public health interventions, to increase children's consumption of fruit and vegetables and, and to determine the effect sizes. Then they did a broad qualitative evidence synthesis of children's <coughs> views and experiences of, of fruit and vegetables. Um, and then they looked at the programme theories of the most effective interventions with the biggest effect sizes and mapped that against children's views and experiences. And there's some really interesting things that came out. So firstly, children conceptualised vegetables differently than fruit. And they actually thought that their families should be keeping them healthy and that food that they eat should be tasty, right? So the message in the most effective interventions was that... Um, fruit is different than vegetables and, and actually fruit tastes nice and you should eat it because it tastes nice. The ones that were the least effective were those that said eat fruit and vegetables because it's healthy for you. Right? So really simple things that if children didn't conceptualise the programme theory of the intervention in the same way that the interventions were designed. And so from my perspective of, of maternal child health, it's about listening to children when designing interventions and that's a really important and clear message. So that's another way of integrating the evidence, isn't it? You do it on a programme theory level, in fact. Yeah. 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 Okay. <coughs> Any more questions? Views? Um, can I just ask, Mamaji, and I'm coming back to you, you have introduced then a sort of quality assessment, and not every synthesis approach does that. And you said that it didn't really matter which tool is the line that you took. Is that right? It does, but we don't recommend a particular Okay, because that's what, because that's what I'm interested in hearing. But, I mean, are they highly variable and highly quality assessed? In terms of they the are. And, oh, that's a good, great question today. So, yes, they, I wish to, you know, you could, you, like, you could do a whole session on quality appraisal, mm -hmm. so it does matter. We don't make any recommendations about a particular tool because um, it, it may well be that you need to use more than one tool in, in a review. Yeah. Okay, so we, we don't have particularly good qualitative assessment tools for um, ethnographic research for that prolonged engagement in the field. So you know it's a bit of a fudge. So the CARVS tool, which is the Critical Appraisal Skills Program tool, you're familiar with that mm -hmm. one. That was never designed for quality appraisal. What it was originally designed for was NHS staff. So your average nurse or doctor working in practice, they saw a paper, they could get the CARVS framework out, and they could just look to see how much it would apply. That evidence could apply to their practice. And it's been translated into a quality appraisal framework. So what it looks at very much is the technical um, quality and the reporting standards of that particular paper. And the bit at the end is, is how relevant are these findings to my practice. You compare that to Jenny Pope and Gareth Williams' tool, which is much more sociologically based. And their primary marker of um, quality is privileging the subjective meaning of the recipients by depth quote, which goes back to some things that you were saying. So the, the, st the marker of quality is the richness of the quoting and the depth and the theoretical nature of it. So in one of our first exemplar reviews for Cochrane, we did, which is the TB review, the directly observed therapy TB review. So Paul Garner did the effect with Jimmy Golnick, um, and then Jenny and I did the qualitative. We, did, we assessed all the qualitative evidence with two tools, so CASP and then Jenny Pope's tool. And it was really clear that some of the studies were methodologically, technically very good, but theoretically really weak. So they scored high mm. a low. You could do a two-by-two you know, two two matrix and map them in the four areas that they could be. And it was possible to have a technical quality report of a paper that scored high on one, but actually, in Jenny's tool, came at the bottom. Um, and we take the same approach with the quality appraisal, that it's just a framework to help you engage with the study. Um, we agree with Cochrane that you shouldn't rank a summed score because not all the domains of quality are equal. So you can't possibly score the 10 questions and come up with a score out of 10 because the quality domains aren't equal and it still involves expert judgment. 
And that's why you do need an, an experienced qualitative researcher to help you make those expert judgments about the quality of a paper. And I would also argue some domain-specific information or expertise. So if you're doing a systematic review on, a, I don't know, a cardiac pacemaker, you need somebody with some experience, a clinical experience in that area, um, whether it be an expert advisory group or some clinical, you know, intellectual experience, academic experience. Mm -hmm. I'm very sort of, you know, signed up to that as well. We, we used, um, we had that same problem as well with ours, and we used CASP and POPE, so we made it, we adapted both and tried to make it not very long, but yeah. I can't remember off the top of my head, something around about nine items, and then we, we devised a system for scoring them, um, a bit like the risk of bias, yes, no, yeah. unclear or not yeah. reported, yeah. Yeah. and then we used yeah. the, the risk of bias traffic light system mm -hmm. for for reporting that, so then instead of the domains of the risk of bias, we would have the the nine domains in our tool, and then just reporting that across red for uh, you know high risk or not high. We didn't call it high risk, but you know pretty pretty poor. Mm -hmm. Green for good, and, and then the um, the yellow for uncertain and not reported. Mm -hmm. You see, I think that that's great for. The context of this review but I think mm -hmm. you know that I had some reservations about doing that and mm -hmm. um, um, because Cochrane methodologically wants to do everything systematically yeah. um, and there are 160 quality appraisal tools for qualitative research and we've just created another one <laughs> <laughs> and there is a sense that you know there is validation testing in the literature of the cast mm -hmm. and then lo and behold in the lay health worker review we actually we only included six out of the ten questions so again we've created a another hybrid of CASP and I think that the bottom line is somewhere we need to come to, consist to some consistency as to, and everything's an adaption isn't it so all the original validation that was done of CASP now no longer or only partially applies mm -hmm. so for you know something about me says that um, it's, it's fine to do this in context but you make it all transparent <coughs> but in the long run we're making things even more yeah, muddled for ourselves well I'm, I just went well when you said 160 tools yes right and have you written that paper um, no, but uh, Mary Dixon Woods did um, an analysis several years ago when there was 140. Um, yes, because I just you know I didn't know that. I think it's very important to get that. Yeah, that that yeah. that tackled actually. Yes. Just for the reason that yeah. you've just said that if we're going to introduce that component, and I actually think it's a very good component. Mm. It is about trying to make it consistent and systematic, isn't it? it and, is. and I know that sort of also goes slightly against the grain when we come forward to it again. But really, in terms of a tool. And what you're trying to achieve with that tool? Yes, we have to do something. You do, but not every tool applies to every methodology, Absolutely. and that's one of the issues. Um, my other sort of to throw into the mix, um, Pierre Pierre um, mm -hmm. from McMaster has just developed a mixed method tool, uh, <laughs> which covers the any methodology, the effect and the qualitative. So there's now that method. So in the interrupt, where's Maria, the systematic review on repeat team pregnancies, the team decided that they wanted to try Pierre's tool. And we met up with him in Quebec. Um, and I'm quite happy to do it, because I think we're in a stage of methodological development, aren't we? We have to try these things to test them out. But I, mean, I think secretly I'm going to be sitting there doing my own expert judgment for all of this, you know? Because um, expert judgment is equally as good, we know, than any of the tools that are available. Um, you know, the, the more junior um, systematic <coughs> review tends to cling on to Need the, something. Needs yeah. something to get started, um, to make it systematic and a reporting standard. Um, I guess the other thing to throw in um, is that we also now are beginning to have reporting standard for qualitative systematic reviews. So we've just got um, Jeff Wall and, and Trish Greenhouse have just published the reporting standards for um, meta-narrative reviews and realist reviews. And Alison Tong and Kate Fleming have come up with the first draft of um, what they want to see in a qualitative evidence synthesis. So, again, more standardisation. Yeah. I don't know if you have an answer to this, but what's the time scale between undertaking a, a qualitative synthesis review and having some findings that are of implication to clinical practice and patient outcomes and the, the cold face worker? Well, how long is a piece of string? Yeah, um, no, I kind of yeah. that. <laughs> well, let me give you one example. So I have a brilliant MSc student, and she, she wanted to do a systematic review on contraception, qualitative systematic review, contraception of women over 40. Great, I thought. You know, so we did the systematic review. Um, we published it in the Journal of Advanced Nursing very soon after. 
then the Family Planning Association chose contraception women over 40 as their national campaign for the following year, and all the recommendations went straight in. Um, so that was evidence into practice, so becoming national guideline in a few months. Um, I have other people that I'm working with who aren't funded on their reviews, who, you know, three years down the line, we're still trying to get the thematic synthesis together and it's dragging and da-da-da-da-da. But that's no different than any other Cochrane mm. review, yeah. all right? Yeah. So mm. you need a certain set of critical success factors coming together um, in order to progress the review. Mm. And it needs to be a priority. And you need to have a deadline. So in WHO, you know, the number of weekends and nights we put in, because that guideline panel was meeting mm. on a certain yeah. date. Yeah. It had to be done, right? Same as nice reviews. The the guideline panel is is, is the, those dates are set when you start them, so you have to you, you just do it. Otherwise, you never get another contract.